Good morning. So anybody that was here last night, does anybody have their little rock with them? Yes. Good for you. I'm probably going to ask you that every week. Good job, right? The rest of them don't have a clue what we're talking about. But you guard that little rock. Um, I, I get uh, invited to people's house quite often. And uh, the, I, don't, I don't know if this is a tradition or what, but they always want the pastor to come for lunch or take him to lunch or something. And obviously, I don't look like I need more lunches. But, you know, after church, I'm pretty much wiped out. And, and sometimes I just say, no, I don't want to. I'm, I'm tired, and I, I just don't do that very well, and I want to go home. Have you invited anybody to your house this week for dinner? Good job. Good job. We... we we have so much stuff that goes on at the table. And I want to talk to you about this table. We get invited to your table all the time. And you're invited to ours. But are you there for the right reason? And do you do the right thing when you're at the table? And in this table, I, I got a whole list of things here that happen. Now, uh, when I was a kid, there were certain things we didn't do at the table. And we knew it. This was, you know, uh, if the phone rang or something, that don't anybody answer the phone. Right? We took our hats off, we got cleaned up, and we came to the table, and it was a proper place. Do you come to the table like that? And whose table are you coming to? When you come to the table, it's a place where family gets together, where friends get together. It's a place where you leave your junk for just a little while. You, you clean your soul, and you come to the table. It's a time of peace in a time of joy. It's a place where we get nourishment and we're refreshed. There's good discussion at the table. There's face-to-face -face talk. There's grace at the table. And at the table, you receive the bread of life and the living water. There's mercy at the table. There's correction and rebuke. At the table. There's fellowship at the table. And there's no weapons allowed at the table. That's your tongue. We don't talk like that at the table. I don't know whether the next generations are actually going to have this or not. They don't maybe understand. You guys know what it means to come to the dinner table? And yeah, well, do you? Do you understand the importance of coming to somebody's table? whether it's your mother's or grandmother's, maybe it's a friend or a relative, when you're invited to somebody's table, it speaks volumes. You're welcome there. Now, there's been times when I've had to invite somebody over that mm, just wanted to see how fast I could get this done. Right? But I holstered the weapon. This is a time of face-to-face -face conversation. And there's a lot of things that go on at the table. And it, you, you hear this all through Scripture. We're going to take a look at Psalm 23, 5. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. To prepare a place at the table in the presence of your enemies would be a, a lot of different meanings. But let's just say you come there to work things out. You come there to take a break. There is peace at the table. Nobody brings any weapons. Or it could be that God is saying, sit down at this table. You're welcome here. And the presence of your enemies might not be sitting at the table. They might just be seeing you at the table. God offers us this table to come to and to sit at his table. And we don't often think about it. Did you come in here this morning for the music? Or did you come in here to hear God in the music? Did you come here to get a, a good message that's relevant to you? Or did you come in here to really seek God and see what he has to say? Did you come in here for the treats? Because they're good. They're real good. This is what we do. We break bread together, even if the treats were bad. I'd still eat them. <laughs> now there's a treat sheet right over there and if you don't feel like you can cook well enough try it anyway we will eat them 
you are invited to this table in this place. And we would hope that we would be invited to your table. God prepares a table for you. Have you ever thought about the person preparing the table? And we don't often do this. A lot of times in our prayers we'll say, bless those who prepared this and who served it and stuff. But do you really think about it when you go to somebody's house? They're they're going to serve you. And, you know, I I try my best. You know, I'll pick up my dish to try to take it to the sink. And they say, no, no, no. They're they're trying to serve me. And I just can't even hardly wrap my brain around that. I, I didn't come here to be served. But yet, at God's table, he serves us. Jesus died for you. At the table. This is where reconciliation comes together. The mercy and the grace. Him hanging on the cross is your invitation to the table. And when the cup overflows, you have to understand the culture of this. The cup, as long as you kept filling somebody's cup, they were welcome to stay. When you quit filling the cup, it was over. And I've done this at probably a lot of your houses before. We're just sitting around talking and all of a sudden I say, I'm done. Uh, This was fun, but it's over now. I have to go, right? (laughs) Probably kept filling my cup, and I just had enough. This is what, when your cup overflows, you're just so welcomed. The person that's serving you is just there to, to serve you and to give you what you need. I want you to invite somebody to your table this week. I want you to invite somebody over to your house and sit at the table with them. And just see what happens. And and you'll probably be amazed at how how proper they act and how thankful they are. This is where so much stuff happens, and we're getting out of the habit of doing it. A lot of people start to get out of the habit of doing it because the, the patriarch that kept it going isn't there anymore. Uh, My mother was like this. All she ever wanted was for her kids to all get together. Just be in one place without fighting, right? Parents want this. Well, moms do. I don't know about dads. Don't you think God just wants his people to come together, sit at his table, not argue, not fight, don't talk about anybody? This is a place where there's going to be peace and grace, and probably somebody is going to be missing at your table this year. Arlene C. Cirillo died this morning. There'll be an empty spot at her table. And she would have been one of these people that was the patriarch. But I don't think Ralph and Vicky will probably ever give it up. You see, the chair's not really empty. Uh, I have Jim Grable's chair here somewhere. Would somebody grab it for me, Kevin? Uh, Jim died, I think it was May 16th of this year. Nancy, is that right? Jim died on May 16th. You see, this chair has been empty since he died. And we've kept it here. Daisy, get him. This is Jim's chair. And this chair has been empty. But is it? It's not to me. That chair is full of joy. It's full of wisdom. It is so full of memories. I I can't even imagine it not falling down. The wisdom and the talks that we had. uh, Jim's salvation. Everything happened in this chair for Jim. This is where he came to sit at the table with the Lord. And this is his chair. And it's not empty. It is so full. Think about it. I think just about everybody in here knew Jim. The chair that you think is empty at your table this year, this week, is so full. Can you even fathom what happened in this chair? How about yours? This chair is so full that I don't know what to do with it. I really don't. But to me, it doesn't really represent Jim. It now represents what Jim would want, which is to put somebody else in the chair. Is that what you want? 
When your chair is empty, when you have a chair that's empty at your table, do you actually want somebody to sit there? Would you give up your chair for somebody else? I've told you before, if you're a regular here and the place is full, get up. Give somebody else your chair. I can see, Jim, not, not so much wanting us to grieve over and over and forever and ever, forever, but to say, fill my chair with somebody else. Is that what you want? That's what God wants. He wants you to put somebody in that spot to come to your table. The chair is not empty at all. It is so full. And an empty chair is an invite for somebody else to come to the table. Whether it's in here, in your home, out there, at your workplace. Can you offer somebody an empty chair? Do you understand the analogy of what I'm trying to tell you here? We're going to fill Jim's chair. We're going to fill it with somebody else, because that's what Jim would want. We're not going to grieve over this chair forever and ever and ever. Jim has made it possible for somebody else to sit in his chair. You are invited to come to God's table, to the table of Jesus Christ. You have a chair waiting for you, and it's up to you whether you sit in it or not. And when you sit in it, you should act a certain way. He tells us how. See, we have this manual. I have these rocks all over. Who did this? <laughs> I, I know what it's about. What was I talking about? This, this was our manual for the table. I don't even know where I was. You see, he wants you to fill the chair. It should never be empty. Whether it's just a pile of memories and joy and happiness and goodness and wisdom, it's still available for somebody else to get that exact same thing. This is why we come to the table, and this is why God wants us to come to his table. The wedding banquet, this is, this is a great parable, but it actually says the kingdom of heaven may be compared to the king who gave a wedding feast for his son, and he sent out the slaves, I'm going to call it servants, to call those who had been invited to the wedding feast. And they were unwilling to come. He invited people to the wedding feast, his son. This was a marriage of Jesus and his church. This is the groom and the bride. This is actually the model for marriage in the Bible. Adam and Eve is an example, but the model of marriage is Jesus and his church. And he invites people to come to that banquet for his son, and they were unwilling to come. So what he does is he tells them to go out and just find anybody. Just, just get as many people as you can to come. You see, the ones that thought they were so righteous didn't. And the ones who needed him the most were very willing to come in. Are you like that? Are you only going to invite the good people to sit in a chair at your table? God doesn't do that. In fact, he actually does just the opposite. If you think you're so good and so righteous, you're actually overly righteous and it's a sin. You are supposed to invite those to the table that need it. I told you I wanted you all to invite somebody this week. And no, you don't have to send me a text and say I did it or send me a, a thing that said I did just want you to do it. Uh, are you going to do it just for the glory so you can tell the pastor I did it? No. You're going to do it because you should. Fill the chair with somebody else. Luke 22, 29 through 30. And just as my Father has granted me a kingdom, I grant you that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom. You're invited to Jesus' table. Can you imagine this? And, and, and we're supposed to do all these things right. We got this whole book on how to act at the table. But you know what? It's okay. 
try your best. Do your best. But if something happens, it's not quite what you think it should be, it's okay. Because he invites you for the right reason. You know, we invite a lot of people over to our house that we just want to rub shoulders with them. You know, we want to get to know them and, and their, their status is such that we want to have them at our house. And, and please, come, come and eat with us when there's somebody that you know of that really needs to sit at your table. Maybe they're hungry. Maybe they just need a hug, a smile, some peace, some joy, some place where they can just put their weapons down and look at somebody face to face, somebody that would love them. That's Jesus' table. Your table is Jesus' table. You represent him as a Christian. You've sat at his table. You've been offered the bread of life, living water. You have to give it to somebody else. You offer it to somebody else. So if you're invited to the table, have you accepted? Have you actually prepared yourself to sit at the table of Jesus Christ? Have you humbled yourself that this would be somebody of of a, a status that we can't even come close to, but he's invited you. The king of kings has invited you to eat at his table. And you know what? You see, back in the day, when you got in the presence of a king, it was usually bad. They were going to hang you or something. When you got called by the king to come and see the king, it was bad. And they were scared. And yet we have this king that now invites you to come to the table that is not like that. His motive is so pure and so good. He just wants to spend some time with you, to eat with you. And this, this eating with Jesus is huge. And I don't think a lot of you understand. When he was resurrected, he said, give me something to eat because spirits don't eat. It was proof that he was a, a bodily person, a bodily human. It's called the soma. It's not a ghost, not just spirit. You eat with him because he can eat. Jim's chair is never full. I'm sorry, never empty. Arlene's chair will never be empty, but they want you to fill it. They want that chair to be full. And regardless of who's missing at your table, don't you think they want you to give the, the next person the same thing that they received? If they were welcomed at your table, shouldn't somebody else? Or is it just, oh, well, things will never be the same. You're right. But you can be better for somebody else. This could be the best thing ever, to invite somebody to sit in somebody else's chair. You know, Jesus gave up his chair for you. It's got blood all over it. That's the only thing that makes it so you can sit in it. That's the only way you can come before the king is to sit where his blood was spilled. So what I want to do is give you a little Bible lesson here. And some people, I'm not, I'm not saying if you ever use this in, in the way that I'm about to present it. it it's okay. It's, it's still all right. Revelations 3.20. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. Now, you've got to understand, Jesus is talking here, right? We've all heard this before. Open the door. Let him in. Answer the door. Right? And you think this is some sort of a salvation thing, right? This is, this is what we tell people. Answer the door. He wants to eat with you. He wants to come in and sit down at your table. But that's not how it's used. And I hope this scares you a little bit. We use it all the time for people to get salvation. But you got to understand the context of what's going on here. This is part of the letter that he wrote to the church and said, you are lukewarm. If Jesus came in here right now and said, you are lukewarm, you're neither hot 
nor cold. I stand at the door and knock. If you let me in, if you hear my voice and let me in, I will eat with you and you with me. Do you understand? This is very harsh. He's calling a church lukewarm. And the lukewarm, here again, you've got to know the culture, right? They had pools. If you're familiar with reading your Bible, there's pools. Oh, they talk about it. Old Testament, New Testament. Summer for bathing. I got some here. Um, the healing pools in John 5. There's the pool of Gideon. There's the pool of Hebron. Uh, in 1 Kings, there's a pool of Samaria that was, actually says it was used for bathing. There's a pool in a tunnel to bring water to the city. That's in 2 Kings. You see, it would be a spring. You understand a pool? He turned the rock into a pool, the hard rock into springs of water. Okay, I'm going to get to a point where all these come together. These pools, there were hot springs where they would bathe, they got healed there. It was for cleaning, cleansing your soul. It would help people that had diseases. And then there were pools that were cold springs. And this was good for drinking. You see, the hot water was good for cleansing, and the cold water was good for drinking. And the warm, lukewarm water, good for nothing, not for your soul not for your being. It actually says, um, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. Mm. He's, he's telling a church this. The cold water was used for refreshing. The warm water, the warm springs were used for bathing and cleansing of yourself, a healing. But the warm water, you ever picked up a bottle of water that's been sitting in your car and it's on you? Man, Jesus is going to spit you out if you're lukewarm. He's telling this to a church that's already established. That'd be like him walking in here right now and saying, you are lukewarm. I'm going to spit you out. Now, you understand how harsh that is, right? So this context, after he gets done telling them all this, he, Re Revelations 3.20, here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. He's talking to a church that doesn't get it. You know, we love to look at this hot and cold, and then these people were just lukewarm, and we love to teach that, eh, you're not hot nor cold, right? You're just kind of doing it for the wrong reasons. Your motives aren't quite pure, and your heart isn't quite right, and you're just kind of going through the motions. And this is actually harsher than that. This, this actually is saying he will spit out the church if they don't change. Somebody comes to the table... You're going to give them something cold to drink? If they need to be cleansed or if they need to be healed, you're going to give them something warm to put on something? Or are you a lukewarm person that Jesus is just going to spit you out? This is extremely harsh. And when somebody uses this, like I say, you can use this in a different way if you want. But in the context of the Bible, this is very harsh. It means they won't even let him in the church. I stand at the door and knock to a church. We say once in a while, if the Holy Spirit left the church, would anybody know it? This is what's happened to that church. It was his seventh letter, and he's saying, you're not hot, because that's good for something. You're not cold, that's good for something. You are lukewarm, and that's not good for anything, and it spits you out. I'm standing at the door. I want to come in. I want to come in and feast with you. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will. This is what it means to let somebody come to the table. They're standing there waiting to come. Will the worship team get ready? They're waiting to come. They need to come. Sometimes we let them in. Sometimes we don't. Sometimes we let them in for the wrong reason. Sometimes we need the hot water, 
or we need the cold water, and they're just lukewarm, so you didn't, don't invite them. The empty chair, it's okay just by itself, right? We'll just, we'll just be sad, and we'll just, oh, I wish that chair was full, and you're not filling it. You all have chairs at your house that could take one more person. What if Jesus said, my table's full, I'm sorry. Those would have been the people that wouldn't attend the banquet. Those would have been the people that wouldn't let him have a chair. What you need to make sure, and why I say you need to invite somebody, is you need to make sure Christ is sitting at your table. If you got an empty chair, you better look at it as though it's Christ sitting there right here, right now. If you don't let Christ sit at your table, you won't have all the things we talked about, all the things that happen at a table. These are the things that, that Jesus offers you if you'll let him in and sit at your table. He invites you to his Jesus offers to cleanse you. Jesus offers you a time of peace and a time of joy. He offers you nourishment and refreshing. He offers to have a discussion and make things happen. He offers you the face-to-face -face time where you can work things out. He offers you wisdom. He offers you grace. He is the bread of life and he is the living water. He's probably going to correct you and rebuke you but there's a time of fellowship and there will be no weapons at his table. All those things that we talk about, things that happen at the table, he offers you. You have a chair that you can invite somebody else to sit at that table and let them meet Jesus Christ. He's there, right? You heard his voice and you let him in or are you lukewarm? If you were hot, of course you'd let him in. It's good for something. It's good for cleansing. If you were cold, of course you'd let him in. It's good for refreshing. It's drinking water. We need it to sustain life. But if you're lukewarm, you won't let him in. You won't offer him a place at your table. And he's going to spit you out. Phew! Right? I didn't come to church to hear that. Huh? It's supposed to make you feel good. Jesus' table. There's a chair that you're invited. Not only that, you can bring a plus one, or a plus two, or a plus three, or a whole busload. He's offering you a place, and he's offering you to bring somebody with. Stop asking him to leave. We let him in for a little while, and then we push him away. He's knocking at the door. He wants back in. Oh, no, not till Sunday morning. That's when you come in. All the rest of the time, you stay outside. Did you push him out this week? Did you push him out today? Did you push him out this month? He wants back in, or he wants in for the first time. He wants to sit at your table, and you're invited to sit at his what you got to stop doing is sitting in the dark at the table. This is what happens when Christ isn't there. He's the one that brings in the light. We even love to eat at candlelight, don't we? Oh, that's so romantic. That's what you do when you... No, oh, never mind. <laughs> Almost said the wrong thing there. What I want you to do is I want you to invite somebody in, and instead of being this dark table that you're sitting at, I want you to introduce them to the light that we love to eat by. And while you're doing it, while you're getting up, while you're, you're getting ready, while you're preparing for all this to happen, I want you to take this darkness, this dry, dusty stuff, your dry, dusty bones, and start making them rattle. Rattle and rattle and rattle till the light appears, the table is no longer dark, and everyone's welcome. Yeah. Isn't that the, ta the table that you want to invite people to?
this week, invite somebody to your table. But I'll tell you what, if you don't want to, you see these empty chairs around here? Let's fill them up. You can invite somebody to this table, your table, right here. We are a church family. We are a church body. If you don't want to do it, invite them to church. Fill a chair. That's the way we're going to reach some people. That's the sound of dry bones rattling. And that's what we're called to do. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much. Thank you for oh, your, your love through Jesus Christ who you sent to die for us. And his bones rattling as they came out of that ground is a sign to us to get excited about it, to let him sit at our table, to be part of our table, and to sit at his as well. He stands at the door. Let's just answer the door. In Jesus' name, amen.